Welcome to Casual Friday. Well, this week I want to show you a finished project, which I gave you a glimpse of last week. And then I want to show you some of the finishing details that I put into this project that won't be noticeable to most people who, are, who, are, who see it, but are visible to me and to the recipients. Then I'm going to answer some knitting questions that some of you have had in my Ravelry group in the past couple of months. So let's get started. So last week I was telling you the story of this knitting or this stocking pattern that I created for my brother's family. So when his son, my nephew, got married, one of the gifts that I offered to the married couple was to knit them Christmas stockings. And so we established what type of stocking that they wanted. And we came up um, with a, a stocking that's in stranded color work. Nobody's name is worked into the top of the stocking, so everybody has their own unique uh, color combination that identifies it as their stocking. One of the features of this stocking is that it has a peasant heel. So the way a peasant heel is typically constructed in a sock or a Christmas stocking is that you knit the leg first, and then you uh, knit in some waist yarn across half the stitches, the stitches where the heel will be, and then you continue working uh, the rest of the stocking till you're done with the toe. Then you come back to where you have marked the location of the heel, take the waist yarn out, which exposes live stitches, recapture those live stitches, and then knit the heel in the round. And you knit the heel exactly the same way that you knit the toe, at least I do in this stocking. When I'm knitting the, this kind of a heel in a sock for a human, I often do a different um, type of, a different set of decreases along that edge. Um, but for a stocking, I maintain it exactly the same. Now, one of the things that I don't like about the peasant heel, really the only thing that I don't like about it, um, is that you have to go back and put the heel in. Every other kind of heel construction is done when you get to that point in the sock. And um, the uh, one other thing that I don't like about the peasant heel is this uh, knitting in the waist yarn because I don't like to release the waist yarn to expose live stitches and then catch them. Instead, I like to capture the stitches that will be live and so that when I remove the waist yarn, those stitches are already on the needles. So I figured out a way to do that a couple of years ago, and I did a, a video on that, which I'll link to here at the top. And the method that I used was to simply slip the heel stitches onto waist yarn, and then to do a provisional cast on. And then I continued on with the leg, and that way it kept the two sets of stitches that were going to be used for the heel, that is um, the stitches around here and the stitches around here, I kept them separate from each other. So when I went to recapture the stitches to put them on the needles, it was much easier um, for me to do that. Well, somebody was asking a question in the technique forums this week about, could you, when you were doing a peasant heel, just do a provisional cast on and knit the heel right then? Um, and then when you're done with the heel, continue on with the foot. And at first I, I, I couldn't imagine how you could do that. The way that, that I had, conceived of doing the provisional cast on wouldn't allow that to happen. But I slept on it overnight and then I realized, oh, I realized what you could do. And I'm going to do a technique video on this probably sometime in the new year. So rather than putting the heel stitches on waist yarn and doing a provisional cast on um, that, uh, that created um, the, the sole stitches, Instead, what you can do when you get to the bottom of the heel is to put the instep stitches on waist yarn. And when you do the provisional cast on for the heel, you're creating um, the stitches that you have live on the needles can be used to knit the, the heel. And then you can come back later, put the stitches that were uh, resting on waist yarn on the needles and then recapture the live stitches from the provisional cast on and then continue on with your foot. And so I was right at, when she asked this question, I was right at this point in my stocking. I was just about ready to place the waist yarn for the heel. And I thought, well, I'm going to try this and see how well it works. And it worked beautifully. Um, I just love this. And I love the fact, and I'm going to use this going forward when I'm knitting socks for humans. Because 
one of the problems with a peasant heel also for me is that if I, if I skip working the heel, I can only work so far in the foot before I want to go back and do the heel just to make sure that I have the foot length correct before I start doing toe decreases. I don't want to finish the foot, then do the heel, and then find out that the foot isn't long enough. So if I can do the heel when I come to it, then I can just keep going and working the sock. I don't have to interrupt myself where I am and go back and do the heel, then go back and, re you know, I don't have to go back and forth. I can just knit the sock in the order in which uh, I would normally knit if I was knitting, using some other heel. So that was a fantastic uh, revelation for me. Um, and I, I love the fact that on my seventh stocking that I'm knitting, normally I don't like knitting things uh, so many times, um, but I'm willing to do that because I do these once a year or every couple of years I'm doing a stocking. But I love that I'm still learning new things even with something that I've done over and over and over again. Uh, the other thing that I decided to do is, I, because I don't do stranded color work very often, my tension is not perfect. I would say I'm an adequate knitter when it comes to stranded color work. And one of the things I love is that ha however crappy your stranded color work looks, once it's had a soak for a couple of hours and you lay it flat, it everything smooths out so much. But I was, while I'm knitting, I always feel like, oh, it looks so bad, it looks so bad. And so I was experimenting with other methods of carrying the yarn while I was working my strand of color work. I mean, I've known about these methods. I just don't typically use them. Typically when I'm working strand of color work, I have one yarn in each hand. And I was experimenting with having um, both of them in the same hand, one over the index finger and one over the middle finger to see if that improved my tension or if I just preferred that process. And I think, I think at this point in my knitting career, it is something that I could continue to practice and get better at. A few years ago when I tried it, I just couldn't, couldn't manage it. But somehow over time, when I, pr I try things and then I give myself uh, time away from that and go back to it again at another time, um, for some reason, I do have a certain amount of muscle memory that makes things um, easier to to do the next time I try it. So the other thing I want to show you about um, this stocking is, are the finishing details. How I attach this I-cord loop so that I can make sure it's not going to stretch and come uh, can come loose. And then what I do um, to finish the inside because one of the things that I worried about when I knit my very first stocking like this was that things that were stuffed into the stocking, little gifts might get caught on the strands and pull and distort things. Um, I was also concerned that if there were things were heavy in here, that it, it might stretch uh, the knitting out too much. And so I decided to line the stocking. And what I do is I line it with fleece um, and, and then a little bit of, of um, seam binding at the top to just kind of give it a nice finished look. And that also helps to support the Latvian braid at the top so that it doesn't roll. So I'm going to show you some overhead footage of the steps that I uh, take for getting this I-cord um, to really stay <laughs> locked in there and then, and then how I do um, the finishing um, inside the stocking. So this is uh, where the beginning of the round is. I'm going to pick up three stitches right along the edge. So I want to go through uh, what actually looks like stitches through the V of a stitch. So I'm going to go through the one that's before the end of the round, the one that's at the end of the round, and then the one that's after the end of the round or beginning of the round. So there's one, there's two, This is number three here. Number three. So I, I'm going to tighten everything up uh, and then I'm going to slide these. From now on, I'm just working like a regular I cord, um, always from the same end. And I'm going to knit this until it's about four inches long. And where's my tails? So I'll tighten those up a little bit. 
and then I just slide them back again to that end and start the next row. And I always tighten uh, each time. I think doing a two color I cord is a nice complement to the Latvian braid that is around the top of the stocking. Uh, it's just kind of, it just doesn't look exactly the same, but it, it has uh, some of the same elements to that. It's just a nice complement. Okay, so that is just about four inches. So I am ready to finish this off and what I'm going to do is cut the two ends. One thing you can do is knit the three of them together. Another thing that you can do is just pass the second and third sets over that first one and then pull those tails through. If you can knit three together with when you've got double strands, good for you. Um, I don't always find that easy. So the reason that I pick up the stitches instead of just knitting a length of I-cord and then sewing both ends is because it secures the I-cord in three places. It actually physically attaches the I-cord. It can't, the, the tail can't stretch out and, and pull anything out. So I have these two tails here and I'm going to uh, weave these in as well as attach the loop to the other end and weave those in. So I have a pretty elaborate uh, way of doing this to ensure that nothing is ever going to pull out. You can do these one at a time. That can help too to split these up and makes, makes the strands thinner and just I just feel that much more secure. And, and the reason I'm doing this is again, because the whole weight of this stocking plus whatever's in it is gonna be hanging from this loop. So what I do is I go up uh, the legs of, you know, each of these look like the, have the, the Vs of a stitch, like a regular stockinette stitch. So I go up uh, one leg on one side, pull that tight, uh, bring, the needle through um, the back of one of those stitches and then come down the other leg. So I've attached this up inside the I-cord itself, attached it in two directions to this I-cord and then I will weave in this tail along the edge somewhere. So I'm gonna do the same thing for this one. I'll go up the legs of a different one of the stitches. So now I need to attach the loop to the inside and then make sure that it's not going to pull loose. So one of the ways that I'll do that is to again go, and go up inside this one for just a little way. I don't necessarily do this exactly the same every time. It's mostly just an exercise in, um, overdoing it. Okay, so if I pull on this, this is pretty secure. So another way I can bury these tails is to go up um, the center of the I-cord. So you're going up the center and you come out so that that needle is not showing anywhere here. Um, pull this up through there. Pull it a little bit too tight snip it near the surface, and then when this stretches out, that tail pops back inside. So one of the things I'm noticing is that when I laid it flat to dry, uh, to dry that this kind of twists a little bit. So I'm going to steam this and get it lined up so that the pattern is where it needs to be before I do the, um, the next step um, of this, which is I put a lining in this. I tape together some paper. I lay the stocking on the paper and then I draw around it with pencil. Then I take the pattern and I lay it on some fleece and draw uh, around the pattern piece um, with a Sharpie. Now I could, if I was feeling daring, I could lay the stocking on the fleece and use the Sharpie and just draw directly on there, but I'm always worried I'm gonna get Sharpie 
on the stocking, so I prefer to work uh, with a paper pattern. Um, and so I cut it out. So this is these dimensions are that are the same as the outside of the stocking, and this is going to go inside. So I am not too concerned about staying very very close to the edges. I I stay reasonably close. Um, but I don't mind, you know, cutting some corners and I can certainly trim off some of this excess. So I keep the lining this way with the sewn parts on the outside because when I put it inside the stocking, um, then I'll have this, this part, just the seam will be there. You won't have the lumpy, lumpy part on the inside of the stocking. So then the, the stocking, when it's done, it will have this lining inside of it. That, that's not the final step. Then the next step that I take is I use some uh, bias tape find, uh, uh, quilt binding um, and I sew it uh, onto the lining and then I sew the lining to the inside and that helps keep that Latvian braid um, from rolling this way because this is stockinette and stockinette wants to roll. So I have something that I've sewn this to and it keeps that sturdy. So because this is knitted fabric that I'm sewing onto, I don't like to use regular sewing thread because I, I worry that the threads will cut through uh, the, the standard thread. So I use, this is called bulky nylon, but it also comes in names like um, woolly nylon. So what this is is a very, it's sort of a fuzzy nylon thread. It's not like a hard nylon, like, um, you, like fishing line or invisible thread or something like this. It's, it's several strands and it's meant for, for uh, sewing knitted fabrics together. So I like to use it when I'm sewing um, the lining into uh, the knitted stocking because then I feel like it's not going to harm the knitted stitches. So the inside of this stocking, you can see it's completely like this. I have the bias tape overlapping a little bit and I've sewn the edge, the lower edge of the binding tape to the fleece. I actually did it on both sides. You could use a sewing machine to do that before you put uh, the lining inside. And then I hand sewed the, the upper edge of that to right below um, this line of stitches here. And that keeps the Latvian braid upright. Uh, one more thing, I've had a few people ask me if I sell that pattern for the stocking or if I plan to sell it. And I've thought about it over the years. I've been kind of ambivalent about it because I feel like I created this for my family. And I don't know how I feel about producing a pattern for that exact stocking um, for the world at large. So I, I may for next year come up with something that's very close to this as a pattern as well as all the information on um, the finishing work and how to line it and all of that kind of thing. That may be something that I will do um, for next year, so like sometime in the fall, so to give people time uh, to knit them for next Christmas. So it's possible. <laughs> Okay, so question time. So I'm going to answer a few questions. The first question that I had, I think it was on a comment on a video from a couple of weeks ago. The question was, if I want to add a cable to a plain sweater, do I need to add stitches? So what she's talking about, or he's talking about, is if you have a pattern for a plain stockinette sweater and you want to put a cable up the front or a cable on each side, do you need to add stitches? Because cables do pull in. They have a different gauge than stockinette fabric has, usually. And it's that usually um, that you need to be mindful of. So what you have to do for cables is because a cable has a very specific number of stitches, you don't really figure out the gauge in terms of stitches per inch when you want to uh, put a cable into a sweater. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a sweater that's uh, 40 inches around, so it's 20 inches wide, and you are working with worsted weight yarn, five stitches per inch, for 20 inches across the front, that's 100 stitches. 
So you are working with a gauge of five stitches per inch. So if you want to make that sweater bigger or smaller, then you reduce by the number of stitches per inch that makes sense in order to get the size sweater that you want. But cables are a specific number of stitches wide. That means that you can't knit more stitches or fewer stitches for that cable. You have to knit the number of stitches that are in that cable. So what you do is you knit a swatch that has the cable in it and you measure how, how wide that cable is. You include your purl stitches that you're flanking on each side. You measure how wide that is. So let's say your cable is two inches wide and it's and it's 14 stitches when you include the purl stitches on each side. So you have a 14 stitches and that's two inches. So what you want to do is replace two inches worth of stockinette with your two inch cable. So if your stockinette is five stitches per inch, you're going to take out 10 stockinette stitches and you're going to put in 14 cable stitches. So that's how that works is because cables have an absolute number of stitches that can't be varied. It doesn't help you to say, oh, I'm getting seven stitches per inch in my cable. You have to replace um, two inches with two inches rather than thinking about it in terms of stitches per inch. And you really need to swatch every kind of cable. If you plan on using more than one kind of cable, you really have to swatch them all because not all cables pull in the same amount. Years ago, I knit a, um, an Afghan sampler cable um, by Janet Zabo. And I'll put a picture up here of, of the, what, what it looked like. And that particular Afghan had, a, she had you always cast on the same number of stitches for, for each square and you knit the same number of rows. But when you got done with the garter stitch border, oftentimes you had to increase a certain number of stitches to make up for the difference um, between um, the stockinette gauge and the cable gauge. So you always started out with the same number of stitches and rows so that they all the squares could be uh, knit together one for one. But inside that square, the stitch counts varied and it, they varied by different amounts. Some of the cables also incorporated lace and the gauge was exactly the same as it was for stockinette. Other cables had a lot going on and were really pulling in and you had to add a lot more stitches. And some of them pulled in a little bit and you had to add a few stitches. So every single cable was different. When you are knitting a sweater that's nothing but cables, you have to swatch. If you're designing it yourself, you swatch all of the cables that you're going to have in that sweater. So you would swatch your center panel and all the, the different cables that you had on the side and you would measure how wide each of those cables were so that you would know how much um, space all of the cables together were going to be put, were going to take up and then the remaining stitches a remaining um, measurement that you needed to fill in with a filler stitch that would get filled in based on stitches per inch because something like um, moss stitch or seed stitch or something like that can be calculated by stitches per inch. So different types of stitch patterns are calculated differently. About a year ago, I had messaged you about yarn and which ones were least likely to pill. You had said something about working with a tighter gauge. Any chance of you doing a segment on how to do that and dealing with the necessary adjustments? So what she's talking about is that some yarns are going to pill more because they're like merino is likely to pill and the looser the yarn is plied like a merino single that's loosely twisted is going to pill a lot and if you knit it to a loose gauge it's going to pill even more and by loose gauge I mean something looser than what it says on the ball band. So people love merino because it's soft and they like to knit to a looser gauge because it takes less time and maybe because they like the drape. But, but when you combine those things together, then you're going to get more pilling. So if you knit to a firmer gauge than what the yarn label says, then that puts the stitches closer together 
and it prevents the friction. This is one of the reasons why when we knit socks, we knit them to a much firmer gauge than what's listed on the ball band because it's gonna retain its shape and it's going to allow less friction between stitches and less rubbing between stitches. And so they're going to last longer. They're not gonna wear out from being worn as much and um, they're gonna hold their shape better. One of the things that you can do is if, you, if you're if you using something like a DK or a worsted weight or an Aran weight, some one of those mid-range uh, yarns, if you knit it to the gauge that's appropriate to the yarn weight below that, then you can use a pattern that's that's written for that yarn weight. So here's an example. You find a pattern or you find a yarn you like, which is worsted weight, and the ball band says to knit it at five stitches per inch. If you were to knit it at five and a half stitches per inch, um, that would be a firmer gauge that would that would prevent the yarn from, um, from pilling as much. And if you had a pattern that was written for a DK weight yarn, then you could just follow that pattern. So your gauge is going to, you're only off by one yarn weight and so you can easily squeeze those stitches into the same um, gauge that is for the yarn weight that's, that's lower than that. So that is probably the approach I would take is, is think of it as a yarn weight um, lower than that and knit it on the needles that that yarn weight calls for and things will be, will match up pretty easily, at least they do for me. So an example that I can give you on how well this works is the sweater that I'm knitting or that I'm wearing right now is made, it's a discontinued yarn, but it was produced by Elan, which is a mail order company. And the yarn is Peruvian Highland wool. And that is a really typical yarn used for sort of worsted weight yarns in a, a lot of companies. I have a, an Aran, a red Aran sweater that I knit, I think 12 or 13 years ago using Elan and using it at a firmer gauge because it was heavily cabled and I wanted it to hold its shape. I didn't, you know, you, when you have something that's heavily cabled and you need more stitches that provides more weight. And so by knitting it to a, a firmer gauge, it holds its shape, but it also just doesn't pill. I hardly have any pills. People can't believe that that sweater is 12, 13 years old um, because it looks brand new. And yet this sweater is knit with the same brand of yarn, but I knit it at the appropriate gauge, like five stitches per inch, and it has some pilling on it. I have a couple of sweaters that were knit with this yarn, and they, they have pilled much more because I knitted at the appropriate uh, gauge for that yarn. So it may not work for all things. If you are knitting something that you want to have drape, like a shawl or something like that, where you want it to be knit to a looser gauge, then you probably need to shift to a yarn, that, a, a yarn that is less likely to pill. So that's gonna be something maybe that's more tightly twisted or tw tightly plied and twisted, um, where the fibers just aren't as loose. And, and perhaps with a, a yarn where the staple length of the fibers are longer. And that's the problem with merino, is that it's a shorter staple length, it's very soft. You know, there are always advantages and disadvantages when you select a particular yarn. A lot of people don't like, they want merino and they want super wash because they, they want to be able to wear it next to their skin. And if you do that, then what you're sacrificing is the stability of the yarn. So. Instead, because I live in a, in a cold climate, I will use wools that are itchy because I always wear a shirt underneath it. So I'm not concerned about that. I, I, I make different choices if the, the wool, the fabric is going to be against a particular part of my body that's really sensitive, like my neck. When I, make, when I knit a scarf, I almost always will use superwash and superwash tends to be more drapey. I don't mind a scarf being drapey. That's not a problem. It's, it's a benefit. So I will, you know, I'll make those, I'll weigh those decisions of the qualities based on what part of my body is going to be exposed to the fabric. So if it's my neck or my forehead, like with a hat, I much prefer um, something that isn't going to itch those particular um, parts of my body. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. 
If you enjoy my Casual Friday podcast, there's an entire playlist of all of my Casual Friday videos right over here. I also upload a new technique video every Tuesday. So you might want to subscribe to my channel and then click on the notifications bell so you can be notified every time I publish a new video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.